But uh, thank God for you and uh, that you love God. Uh, I don't turn that screen off there, Mark, so we can get to, there we go. Uh, I, I don't think I heard anything about confession of my sin in, in the sense of staying close to God until I was about 16. That's hard to believe in it, growing up in a pastor's home, in a church home. I don't ever remember hearing any, any sermons on it or any teachings on it. But uh, we went to a Campus Crusade for Christ uh, training called Lay Institute for Evangelism and, uh, down in First Baptist of Titusville back when Peter Lord was there years ago. And uh, <coughs> I learned, uh, as my dad and the rest of us learned, we learned what confession was all about because they, they were teaching us about the uh, filling of the Holy Spirit and how that in order to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you had to, be, had to have a clean heart and stay confessed up. We didn't, I didn't know what that meant. Never heard about it until then. And, uh, but uh, as I was thinking about the Lord's Supper, he just put it on the altar there, brother. We'll get it. We'll get the ushers will count it after a while and get it to Brother and Dan. But uh, thank you. Thank you. Give Dakota a hand for work serving Jesus. I thank God for young people that are willing to stand and do what God asks them to do. And I'm thankful for people like Dan Royal that, you know, he's, he wants to give his life to missions. How many people are standing in line to do that these days? Not a whole lot, you know, but I thank, I thank God for that. And, and we need to be about the master's business. We, we talk about being an Acts 1-8 church, and that's, this is part of it. And that's why we expose you to numerous missionaries. About a missionary every other month this year is what I, my goal was in order to, uh, to make uh, our minds stay on focus when it comes to being an Acts 1-8 church. But today I was thinking about the Lord's Supper, and it was Lord's Supper Sunday, and I thank Greg and Wendy for coming every week or every month and doing that for us, getting the elements ready. But the question, uh, you know, what's the big deal about confession? You know, uh, there are many people today that don't know what it means to confess their sins. A whole lot of people don't want to confess their sins and don't think they need to, but there's a whole lot of people that don't know what that means. And some people think that you... Uh, go to a little booth and you pay a little money to a person you can't see and you confess your sins. There's a whole lot of people confessing their sins online now. I don't know if you've ever researched this, but go on Google and Google it. Confession of your sins. Uh, confession of sin service. Put that in Google. You'll get a hundred sites will pop up. You can actually call people 1-800 numbers and confess your sins to them. There's even some for, for criminals that can call and privately confess the, the crimes they've committed uh, anonymously in uh, thinking that that's going to absolve them of their guilt and absolve them of their sins and be forgiven. But folks, there's only one human that we can confess to, the man, Christ Jesus. Amen. He was 100% man and 100% God. But uh, there are many people today that call themselves Christians, yet they live in gross, continued sin. And uh, we're going we're gonna to look at that here in a few minutes. But the Bible is explicit, and it names the sins that we ought not to be participating in. It tells us the types of things that we ought to, to be confessing and forsaking. But uh, I want to take you to the Word of God this morning. And, and uh, you'll notice on the right side of your outline, there's some, some warnings to those that try to live on, live on the fence. You can't live on the fence if you're a Christian. You have to be in or you're out. You have to have the real deal. And we're all the way with God or, or not at all. You can't be in the middle. And so we can't live in sin and be right with God. And, and that, those uh, First Corinthians passages there deal with that. And uh, many of the First Corinthians were, it was a very, very, very fleshly, worldly type church. And a lot of the believers there were thinking they could live one way and still be Christian. Oh, no, you can't do it. And uh, today, as we deal with confession, we're going to go to 1 John 1, 9. I love 1 John because all through this book, many times, the statement comes in there, my little children, my little children. And uh, this book, these books are written to Christians like you and me, those that love the Lord and are trying their best to live for Him. So when it says, my little children, it's not talking to the world at large. It's talking to those that have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's what... 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 says, This is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you, God is light and there is no darkness in Him at all. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. 
Verse 7, but if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. Let's begin with prayer as we think about confession. And what's the big deal about confession? Lord, I thank you so much for the word. And I thank you that your blood does cleanse us from all sin. And Lord, we do have an avenue of escape from these sins that tro so trouble us and plague us at times. Lord, we have a, an avenue right straight to you through confession. So Lord, I pray today that we will learn about confession and practice confession. And stay close to you, Lord. And keep our fellowship uh, tight with you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. First thought I had about confession, and, and uh, maybe you might have thought the same thing. What is the purpose of confession? Why do we need to do that? Well, the purpose of confession is to, to bring sins that we commit before our Heavenly Father and allow Him to clean us up. There's a cleansing of the mind when we confess. There's a cleansing of the soul. There's a cleansing of the spirit. There's a release from guilt when we go before the Father in confession. So confession involves all those things, but there are three other things that it involves, and one of them is confession involves obedience to God's Word. God's Word tells us to confess our sins. Uh, he clearly, you know, when we do it, we're actually obeying God. We're doing what He said. Now, I had some of my principles, from one from Riverside and one from Countryside here a while ago, and, and I, I talked about the kids that we have to confront sometimes in school. Kids are always, how many of you know that kids do bad stuff sometimes? And when I say bad stuff, they're not killing one another. You know, get, understand, they're cheating, lying, sometimes they'll steal, sometimes they'll talk back, sometimes they'll fight. But you know the hardest thing to get a young person to do when you confront them about their sin? What do you think the hardest thing for us is? To get them to what? Admit it. They will go to great lengths to cover it. They will go to great lengths to blame it on somebody else. They will go to great lengths to, to try to not own up to the fact that they sinned. And I'm telling you, sometimes it takes us hours to get a tiny kid to confess something we know they did. We've got the evidence in our hand, yet they won't admit it. You see, confession... But for an adult, think of how hard it would be to get an adult to really confess that they did something wrong. We have whole, in fact, I don't know if you know this, 80% of our budgets, state government budgets, national governments, the money has spent to, do, to fix behavior-related problems. Think about it. If you could take away the behavior-related problems from society, you would eliminate 80% of the, of the budgets that we have, the tax money we have to spend. Think about it. And it's because people do bad stuff. We have to cover for their, their bad mistakes. We have to cover for their honoriness, uh, not taking care of their own children. We have to feed their children. All, just name it. And put them in jail, and they go back to jail after they, they repeat, repeat criminals. It's, it's over and over and over again. Listen, 80% of the money is spent on behavior-related problems. And if we could just get people to own up to their own sin. See, confession involves being obedient to God and owning up to your sin. Listen. God knows you did it. Listen, you can't hide. <laughs> People think they can hide from God. They, they hide it from humans. They can't hide it from God. So confession involves being obedient to God. Think about an, addi an addict, of, uh, say, a, say if he has a, an addiction with drugs or alcohol. What's the first step in helping them get better? They have to admit they're an, an addict. I'm an alcoholic or I'm a drug addict. If they won't admit that, then you can't even start the process. So they have to admit it. In the same way with us, confession is a, is involves obedience to God's Word where we actually uh, begin to agree with God. And the, the word confess is a Greek word, homologeo. In that word, homologeo means to say the same thing about. If we homologeo our sins to the Lord, if we confess our sins to the Lord, if we say the same thing about our sins to the Lord, it says He's faithful and just to forgive us. So we agree with Him that it is, it is a problem. You know, Johnny, did you, uh, did you steal that dollar from that little girl? How did you get that dollar? Where did you get that dollar? 
you, it's so hard to get them to confess. You know, it's, it's hard to get you to confess too. You know that. You really. You know that you, adults are even better at it than kids, because you've developed a lot of years of covering, <laughs> covering your stuff up. But see, when we confess, we're we're being obedient to God. God says, "Agree with me on the fact that you did do it, and it is a sin. You shouldn't be doing it, and you're." You know, you're coming clean before me. So when we finally reach that point of agreement with God about our sins and agree to forsake them, then and only then does God restore the fellowship. You see, confession involves being obedient to God. Confession involves agreement with God about our sins. It's not pretty, it's not good, it's bad. And God says it's bad and you agree with Him. You're right, Lord, it is bad. Third thing, confession involves restoration of our fellowship with God. How many of you have ever slept on the couch before, you husbands? How many of you wives have ever slept on the couch? Not admitting it. How many of you have ever, ever not talked for about three days? Got some liars out there in the audience today. <laughs> Nobody raising their hand. Nobody owning up to it. Y'all get mad at one another and you don't talk. And you, one goes to sleep in the other room. And you give each other the cold shoulder. And then... Finally, you get things right. Isn't it, isn't it sweet when you make up? How many of you think making up sweet? Huh? Yeah? You know what I'm talking about? That's really sweet then. Now, think about the fellowship when we're alienated from God and we're not getting along and he's not listening to us and we've been doing the wrong things and then we get things right. It's just like a husband and wife getting back together and enjoying one, each other again. Same thing. You know, we restore the fellowship with God. So confession, uh, it, it's, uh, the purpose of confession is to get us back into close fellowship with God again. Restore that relationship with Him. Uh, 1 John chapter 2, uh, he, he continues right after the confession part. He says, my little children, I'm writing this to you that you will not sin. He's saying, I hope you won't. I wish you would. How many of you just hope you don't sin? Y'all hope you don't sin, really? How many of you want to just say, I'm going to go out and just raise Cain and sin this afternoon? No, nobody, in, in, no Christian in their right mind would say that. So he's saying here, my dear children, I'm writing this to you that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. You see, I don't want to sin. I don't plan on sinning. But you know what? I probably will. Why? Because I live in a fallen world and I live in a body that's decrepit from sin. You know, and my soul is saved. I'm going to go to heaven when I die. But I've still got to live this life out in a sinful world. And sometimes sin rubs off on us. Sometimes we do and say the wrong thing. He says, I wish you wouldn't do it. But if you do, we have an advocate. Look at verse 2. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins. And not ours own, only our sins, but the sins of all the world. And we can be sure that we know we that we know Him if we obey His commandments. Verse 4 says, If someone says, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person's a liar and is not living in the truth. But those who obey God's Word truly show how completely they love Him. That is how we know we're living in Him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Would you say amen? amen. A Christian ought to live like Jesus did. Remember the bracelets we wore, WWJD? What, what would Jesus do? You know, the kids, that was a big deal, wasn't it? Why did kids do that? Well, and why did adults do that? Because we really do want to live like Jesus did. In fact, Christian, the word Christian means little Jesus. You know, there's, there's some little Jesuses over there. Why did they call them little Jesus as well? Because they tried to live like Christ did. See, and we ought to as well. A Christian ought to be living as Christ did. And, and if we say we love him, but we're not living that way, then we got this problem. And, and we, we need confession. There's a purpose for confession. The second place is the place of confession. Uh, it's not a little wooden room where you go and pay money to a person you can't see and talk to. That's not the place of confession, although it's called a place of confession. It's not on your telephone calling the 900 number at night. Oh, I know what I did. No, that's not the place of confession. The place of confession is at the point of sin. We ought to do it the moment we sin and we, we know we did wrong. That should be the point of confession. But a lot of times that doesn't happen. We have to wait for a while or, or we don't think about it. And then we have to be convicted of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit knocks on your heart's door and says, Ooh, <laughs> my, my parents raised me to have a strong moral conscience. And I could sin, but I couldn't feel good about it. <laughs> and I didn't enjoy it much. You know why? Because as soon as I would do it, I had my conscience was getting on me. 
And the Holy Spirit was getting on me. Why? Because my parents raised me that way. Because I received Christ at a young age. And, and that moral conscience is there. You know, see, some people don't have that because they weren't raised in a Christian home. Or, or the Holy Spirit might not be in their life. Could be the other reason. See, some people can sin to the point they have no conscience. And do all sorts of bad, evil things and not even feel bad about it. But, see, the place of confection uh, at the point of sin or at the point of conviction... A lot, of, a lot of Christians wait until they just get hammered by the Holy Spirit. You know, and he, he just gets on them and gets on them, and they finally come to that point of conviction of sin. You see, confession can happen anywhere, and it ought to. Wherever you find yourself and whenever you find yourself in sin, that's the place of confession. You need to stop at that point and confess your sin. What about the power of confession? Well, I was thinking about the power of confession. In it, I was thinking about what that scripture said there. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So if you think about what it does, confession engages God's faithfulness, turns him on. It turns that faithfulness of God on. God's faithful to forgive us our sins if we confess our sins. Uh, mama used to hold me down and scrub me. How many of you ever had a mama that give you, a, I mean, a real scrubbing? Huh? How many of you, you, you know, do you remember that? They'd call it child abuse these days. Come on, she'd get me and hold me down, scrub me and scrub my ears, and I'd and she'd get my nose. And why was she doing that? Well, she wanted me squeaky clean. That's why she'd get me clean, you know. And see, God wants us squeaky clean for Him. He wants us to be living holy, righteous lives. You know, be ye holy is what the Scripture says. Be ye holy, you know. And see, the holiness, the Pentecostals don't have anything on us. Baptists ought to be holy, and you know, Pentecostals ought to be holy, and Presbyterians ought to be holy, and anybody that calls themselves a Christian ought to be holy, be living right. Does that mean we're perfect? No, because 1 John 2 says we have an advocate. We don't want you to sin, but if you do, we have an advocate. But see, we ought to have as our goal and as our, our ideal is to walk with God and be holy, and we have the power to do that because of Christ living in us. But... God's faithfulness is engaged the moment we confess. Uh, confession reinforces our kinship with the Father. When we become a Christian, the Bible says, but as many as received Him, to them gave He the right and the power to become the children of God. See, we're, we're not slaves or uh, just friends. We're kids. We're God's kids, you know. And, and it reinforces the kinship of the Father when we confess. All right, it's... Uh, when you, like when you're little and your mama and daddy catch you stealing cookies or something, you know, and they get on to you. But if they're a good parent, even after they get on to you, what do they do? They put you in their lap and they love you. They love you back in the fellowship. You see, confession engages God's faithfulness and, and reinforces a kinship. And it unleashes the power of the shed blood of the Son of God. Hey, remember the song we used to sing? There is power, power, wonder working, power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, one to work in power. What's the rest of it? And the, the church knows that song. Why? Because it's been a staple of our faith and we, we go right over it and don't think about what it means. Listen, confession unleashes the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Isn't it good to know that? Third thing, the, or the fourth thing, the privilege of confession. Listen, confession is only available to God's kids. Those people out there in the world that are living under a load of sin, unless they come to God for salvation and for, for forgiveness of their sins, they can pray like a holy roller preacher, and it won't matter. <laughs> they can call those 800 numbers and confess all they want to. It won't matter because until it comes under the blood of Christ, see, they don't get the privilege of being a child of God. And see, confession is only available to God's children, not to the world at large, but to God's kids. It's something that he opened up for us. Confession only works for the believer. It doesn't work for the unbeliever. Until he confesses Christ as the Savior and Lord, they, he pray and his, his prayers just bounce off the ceiling. They don't matter. They're irrelevant. And you won't be reincarnated like the, the poor Buddhists, as Brother Dan was saying. They think you, you know, if you, you're being reincarnated and you get punished for stuff in the past. No, no. <laughs> Nothing could be further from the truth. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that blood, lose all their guilty stains. You see, confession works for the believer, and it cleanses our sins. And confession restores our fellowship with God. 
You remember old David, King David? Remember his life? What did he do? Great king, wasn't he? But he messed up. What did he do? What kind of sins did he commit? Adultery. Murder. Deceit. Uh, covering his sin. Uh, manipulating situations for his own good. All kinds of conspiracy. All kind of stuff. All kind of sins. Now listen, he covered that for a long time, but he finally confessed. Listen to, listen to what he said. Psalms 32. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those who record, whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in a complete honesty. When I refuse to confess my sin, my body wasted away and I groaned all day long. Day and night your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and I stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Isn't that good? You see, confession is powerful. It's a wonderful privilege we have. Remember the, the uh, prodigal son when he went away and, li and he lived the wrong life and he spent all his money, just re totally wrecked his life. But you know, the father was sitting there on the, at the house waiting on him. And, it, and, it, and he says, you know what? I think I'll go home. I could be a slave at my daddy's house and live better than I'm living right here. <laughs> and it says, when he, when, he, when he father saw him coming down the road, he says, the father ran to meet him. See, that's how God is. Father wants, to, wants us to stay confessed up. He wants us to stay clean. And he waits on us to do the turning. He can't make us, or he could make us. He could just kill us, you know, or push reset. But he doesn't. He's long-suffering. Hoping that we will come to our senses. Listen, as a Christian, you need to come to your senses. You need to start doing it right. Don't pretend. You can't live on the fence. You can't live both sides. If you're living on the other side and you're living like you're lost, you probably are lost. If nothing happens and you continually do that and nothing changes in your life, then you're probably lost. You might say you're a Christian, but you're probably lost. That's why I added those scriptures over on the right side of the page there. It's important that we, we uh, you know, Warn those that are trying to live double lives. You can't do it. You can't live a double life. You know, you say say this, but you do this. You can't do that. You gotta get. You gotta get on hundred percent. You gotta be the real deal, as they say. I like to run across the real deal occasionally, don't you? I mean, you like to see the real deal in the Christians. Amen. And uh, I, I think a whole lot of you are the real deal. We're going to have the Lord's Supper now. And I want you to take that little piece of paper that I gave you. It's a little little slip. And I want you to ask the Lord, say, Lord, show me what, to, what I've done wrong this week and this month. And I want you to write it. Don't let the person next to you see what you're writing. Try to write a little private note like you did in school. Remember, you shield your note so that nobody could see your little note. Okay, do the same thing. Write, your, write, write on that little slip of paper. Okay. <laughs> Abbreviate. One word answers. Don't write a sentence. Put a one word answer. Not big enough. <laughs> that was good, sister. One word answers. Okay? And then fold it. Don't fold it a bunch of times. Fold it once so nobody can read it. And when you come up to bring the Lord, you come to the Lord's Supper, we're going to drop it in the, the bowl there. That's not Kool Aid. We're not Jim Jones. Okay? We're not going to drink the Kool Aid. <laughs> It's just an object lesson to show you something from the Word. So I'm going to give you a moment to, to do that. What we're going to do is we're going to... We're going to come up and stay up together, okay? We're not going to pass the plates to you. You're going to come, come up and take it up here with me. If, you're, if you can't stand for very long, if you have trouble and you need to sit, we're going to reserve the front row for you. So come up and those that are older and can't stand, I want you to just have this front row. We're going to move everything for you so that you have a whole row here that you can use. And, uh, but when you come up, drop your, your, your little slip of paper with your confession to the Lord and put it right in there. And what you're doing is you're confessing to him, not confessing to me. And nobody's going to read it but him. I won't know it. Nobody will know it. Only he'll know it. But what you're saying to him is, Lord, I want to be clean with you. And here's what I'm confessing today. And I want you to bring it and give it to him. Confess it to him and let it go. Drop it right in here. And then take, take the, the uh, drink.
drink, take the bread, and stay right up here with me. Everybody that can stand, stand. If you can't stand, I want you to just come and sit because I know some of you can't stand for very long. So let's start on this side first, and y'all come up. I started there last time, so we're going to be of equal time. Start with this side. Be real reverent and no talking, please. Jesus, 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 Christ is alone. I come and behold. Remember this when you put your sins under the blood of Jesus Christ, they're cleansed. Cleansed forever.
just had a thought. I was thinking, all the sins in our whole lifetime, and I committed a bunch of them. I'm probably, be- I'm probably worse than some of you. But my Jesus cleansed it. Here's what he says. It says in 1 John 1, 7, We walk in the light as he himself is in the light. We have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses from all sin. Folks, I know one thing. I'm a, I'm a thankful boy. <laughs> and if you're not thankful, and if you don't appreciate what he's done, you don't realize how bad you were. <laughs> but you know what? It says, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. This... this You can't anymore go back and find those sins and bring them back up if you wanted to. It's all gone. Dissolved in the blood of Jesus. (laughs) That helps me sleep at night. I don't know if it does you or not. Aren't you glad? You know, we we so casually do the Lord's Supper a lot of times. We don't even think about it, do we? And we tell every, every time I, I read 1 Corinthians chapter 11 to you, and it says, judge yourselves that you won't be judged. You know, confess your, we'd always do a quiet time of confession, and we ought to. But confession is important. And I hope today you've, you've understood. The Lord taught me more about it, just studying this, and thinking about it, and preparing a sermon. I said, I want to be more diligent about confession, and staying confessed up, because God told us to do it. So it's really aligning, making us obedient to him when we do it. As you think about that today and we take of the elements, the Bible says, these do in remembrance of me. It doesn't say, you know, some people think it becomes the, body, the blood of Jesus and the body, and I don't believe that. I believe it's a memorial. It's, it's a, an ordinance. An ordinance means something Jesus ordered us to do. Two things that we have in Baptist churches that set us apart, and the two ordinances are baptism when we're saved, not as children, but once we're saved, and then the Lord's Supper. This table we're doing right now, we call it the Lord's Supper. We could call it the Lord's Lunch or the Lord's... It wouldn't really matter. It's the Lord's Table, isn't it? And uh, as you think about it today, what, what, did his, what did this bread represent? What did they do to Jesus' body? If you could see a picture of a crucifixion victim, you need to watch Mel Gibson's movie on the, the, the crucifixion sometime. If you want to see what it was really like, that was a real portrayal. That's what it was like. That's what they did to his body. Think about it. The, the most perfect one that ever lived on earth, and they did it to him. And they hate you if you stand for him. If you take a stand for that Jesus on this earth, the world hates your guts. They don't admire you for your good life and walking like Christ. They hate you. And if they have an opportunity to take your life, just like they did Jesus, they will. But you know what? He died for us. He gave his own body for us on the cross. Aren't you glad? Hold it up to him today and say, thank you, Jesus. I can't even think about this without being moved. (laughs) I love my son. He loves me because I'm his son. But I promise you this, my daddy wouldn't give one drop of my blood for you. And I wouldn't give one drop of little Billy's blood for you either. I love y'all, but I wouldn't do that for you. But you know, our Heavenly Father did. (laughs) Can you imagine what it must have been like when he left heaven that last time before he came down? What kind of goodbye did the father have with his son that day? Knowing what was coming. Must have been a sad day. You know what? It's because of that. Because of that great, the greatest sacrifice in the history of the world was the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ when he shed his blood for all of our sins. Aren't you glad? Say thank you, Jesus, as you hold it up to him and as we partake of it. Thank you.
Well, I love you guys. I know you love Jesus. And I know you really want to walk with him and be clean before him. But we can't do it without confession. So take it home with you today. Take confession home with you. And, and when it comes into your life, when things come in, go wrong, then confess to him. Brother Mark, do we have a closing song that we can do? I think we do. Okay. If everything stayed in it. If it stayed in it. Yeah. We're having a little bit of new, Wendy's 10's hurting us, so we'll see what happens. There is a place to open the timeline with that little, if the timeline's not open. And tell me there's a green line there in the timeline. I hope. On there is a place. No green line? Okay. We don't have. <laughs> it's not there. It, it threw it away. So, we don't have a closing song. Y'all know, blessed be the tie that binds. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred might is like to that above. God bless you guys and girls. We'll see Amen. you hopefully Thursday. No, no Wednesday night now to be Thursday. So please come Thursday and pray with us. Thursday at 6 right here. Bring finger foods to go with the finger food fellowship. God bless you. See you next time.